Uh, again, my name is Hadrian Merchants Kirkwood. I'm a senior researcher with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, which is uh, located, or the national office of which is located in Ottawa on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabek people. So uh, thank you to them for allowing us to use this land. And welcome everyone to the latest chapter in the webinar series. With everything up for grabs, the Green New Deal's The World Needs Now, which is being put on by the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, both the Brussels and New York offices, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, and the Institute for Policy Studies. So it's been a real collaborative effort, and it's been a, a fantastic series so far. Uh, we're really looking forward to continuing that momentum today. And a lot of what we're talking about today builds on the webinar we had two weeks ago. Um, I would also like to begin, before we get into more of the details, uh, to acknowledge and commend the uh, anti-racist and anti-fascist activism that's taking place in the United States right now uh, in response to the murder of George Floyd and the epidemic of police violence in the U.S. I'd also like to point out that there are solidarity actions occurring around the world. Uh, this is not just a U.S. issue. Um, and although this past week has been uh, difficult, of course, it's a very important reminder to us in the climate justice movement that climate justice is racial justice. Uh, and fighting oppression is as central to a Green New Deal as is reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And those of us working on environmental issues need to be uh, active anti-racist, anti-fascist climate fighters. Um, it is all uh, part of the same thing. So uh, let's keep that in mind uh, as we move forward today. Uh, the, the specific title of our webinar today is Confronting the Free Trade Model, Trade Treaties, Energy, and Green New Deals. Um, and we're going to explore the ways in which the current trade and investment uh, regime interferes with uh, the Green New Deal vision of a broad uh, social and economic transformation to address the joint crises of climate change and inequality. And again, what we're talking about today is building on uh, some of the previous webinars in this series. Uh, two weeks ago, we talked at a very high level um, about the sort of free trade model. Today, we're going to be talking in a bit more detail uh, about uh, specific barriers and strategies for overcoming them uh, in the context of free trade and a Green New Deal. Uh, we'll be doing that looking at some specific examples um, of renewable energy disputes under the World Trade Organization. Uh, as well as investment disputes uh, under the Energy Charter Treaty. And we're also going to talk about ways to uh, begin to overcome some of these obstacles, uh, in part through a reflection on how the, uh, the COVID crisis has sort of changed uh, the realm of political possibility. So we'll be talking about all of that in this session. Of course, it's not just me here. Uh, I'm joined by two fantastic guests and experts in the field. The first of which is Pia Eberhardt. Uh, she is a researcher and campaigner with the Brussels-based lobby watchdog Corporate Europe Observatory. She's based in Berlin and has worked extensively on, uh, on a specific aspect of international trade and investment agreements. Uh, that is the extreme privileges granted to foreign investors um, known under the acronym ISDS. Uh, of course, her expertise goes beyond ISDS, but that will be one of our focuses today. And Scott Sinclair, uh, my colleague at the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. He's a senior researcher and director of the Trade and Investment Research Project. He's written widely on trade policy issues and specializing in the impacts on public services and regulation. And he is based in Prince Edward Island in Canada. So the way it's going to work is we're going to do three rounds of discussion. Um, and then we'll open things up to audience questions. So the first round is going to be about renewable energy and free trade agreements. The second round is going to be about how we work around, uh, how we begin to work around the constraints imposed on us by free trade agreements. And then the third is going to be uh, a discussion about how the context has changed because of COVID and what lessons can we learn for a Green New Deal and for reforming uh, the free trade regime from uh, the response we've seen to COVID in the past few months. So those are the three topics we're going to address uh, um, at, at first. But we'd really encourage you to submit your questions um, because a big part of this webinar is going to be uh, addressing your questions, uh, talking about the issues you want to talk about. So please do feel free to ask your questions in the Zoom chat box at any time. Um, I'd also say, uh, please do tell us uh, where you're from. It's great to know who's joining us. And I, I see there's a lot of people 
already in the chat box uh, uh, saying where they're from. We have people from all over the world already joining us. Um, but yeah, again, just throw your questions in there as they come up. And our uh, moderator, Aaron, behind the scenes is going to be uh, pulling those together. And we'll do our very best to answer as many of your questions as we can uh, in the time we have today. So I think that's all the, the kind of housekeeping stuff out of the way. Um, before we turn things over to Pia and Scott, uh, I'd like to just provide a little bit of uh, context for the issues we're talking about today. And the first is just, what is a Green New Deal? Um, those of you who follow along in the webinar, or I'm sure most people uh, watching today are familiar with the Green New Deal, but just so we're all on the same page, uh, what we're talking about here is a broad project of social and economic transformation to address the joint crises of climate change and inequality. Um, it sees those two crises as intertwined and inextricable, and therefore they need to be addressed together. Um, it involves both grassroots movements, but also top-down policy change. Uh, this is, again, a very comprehensive idea. And one of the key political messages here is that there are tangible benefits for working people, for communities, things like good jobs, enhanced social security, accessible education, universal health care, and so on and so on. Um, that are all part of this project of reducing emissions. So although of course the environmental goals are essential, they're not always front of mind in the Green New Deal. We do see these things as holistic and comprehensive. Now, specifically, there are a few areas of a Green New Deal uh, that I wanna highlight. So this is not everything in a Green New Deal, but a few areas that are really relevant to our conversation today, because these are policy areas that are implicated in free trade agreements. So the first is the idea of decarbonization, which is reducing or, or eliminating greenhouse gas emissions from our economy. That's going to require things like regulating fossil fuel projects, strengthening uh, regulations like carbon pricing and so on. Um, there's the issue of environmental reclamation. So this is things reclaiming mines, uh, expanding parks and protected areas, expanded public ownership that could involve creating new public utilities or, or bringing privatized utilities back under public control. And similarly, the expansion of public services, things like pharmacare, for example, or home insurance, um, as well as bringing privatized services back under public control, things like water and waste management, which has been privatized in much of the world. Job creation is a big piece of uh, a Green New Deal, whether that's through something like a jobs guarantee, uh, investment and training, or even something like a basic income. And then there's also the idea of sustainable procurement, um, using government funds directly to support inclusive and green growth. Um, and I mentioned uh, these specific areas of a Green New Deal. Again, not exhaustive. There are other parts of a Green New Deal that are worth talking about. But these particular areas are very vulnerable in the context of free trade agreements. Um, and that's something that uh, we should keep in mind. Um, in general, and we're going to get into this in more detail today, uh, some of the barriers that FTAs present to Green New Deal style policies are, well, first of all, the kind of fundamental incompatibility with the ideologies, the idea of of free trade agreements is that we, we have this neoliberal free market imperative and that just doesn't work with the idea of managing and directing the economy towards pro-social goals. Um, specifically, there's the issue of investor state dispute settlement. Uh, Pia and Scott will talk a bit more about that, uh, which allows corporations to directly challenge governments for uh, public interest regulations. Um, and we see the, the grounds for challenging uh, are broad and, and sometimes continue to get broader. So corporations can challenge governments on, on the grounds of expropriation, national treatment, performance requirements, uh, most favored nation. These are all familiar phrases for, for uh, trade policy folks. Um, but the point is that there's a lot of different ways that governments can be challenged um, for taking measures in the public interest. Uh, putting corporations aside, we also have the issue of state to state challenges. So governments can challenge each other over things like local preferences. Uh, and Scott's going to discuss an example of that soon. Uh, intellectual property rules present a barrier because they can inhibit the, uh, the transfer of essential technologies. And of course, we need to be getting uh, new and cutting edge uh, green technologies to uh, especially developing countries, but every country needs access to these new technologies to decarbonize. And then there's the general problem of a free trade model that, that encourages us to ship goods uh, to every corner of the world, uh, just facilitates uh, emissions as an integral part of the supply chain. And there's no way to get around uh, increasing trade volumes without increasing emissions. So there's a, a wide variety of barriers that FTAs present to the idea of a Green New Deal. And we're gonna dive into those in a bit more detail. Um, 
I would just like to mention uh, one more time, do please uh, throw your questions in the chat as we go. I'll mention that you have the option in the chat to, to send a message to all panelists. So that's something that we will see here, which is great. But if you want the other attendees to see your message as well, make sure you, you send the message to all panelists and all attendees so that everyone can see, see your comments. Um, so you have the choice there, whether to send it just to us or whether you want to send it to everybody who's watching today. Okay, so that's uh, it's been me talking for a lot uh, for a long time here. So I think uh, we should turn things over to uh, to our experts, Pia and Scott, and we're going to start with our first round of of uh, discussion here, and that's about renewable energy and free trade agreements. So I, I'd like uh, I'd like our guests to tell us about how uh, trade agreements and investment treaties have been used to challenge uh, what would otherwise uh, appear to be very promising national renewable energy policies. So things that might have created local benefits from clean energy production, or, or that would support the just transition away from polluting carbon-based energy. Uh, Scott, why don't we start with you? Okay, thank you very much, Hadrian. Uh, and um, it's a real pleasure to be participating in this webinar. Thank you to the other presenters, uh, the translators, of course, and, and the organizers, and welcome to everyone who's joined us. Before I try to answer uh, the first question from Hadrian, I, I, I want to acknowledge that the land where I'm speaking from today is the traditional and unceded territory of the Abigwit Mi'kmaq First Nation. And Canada likes to refer to itself as a trading nation, but it's important to acknowledge that a lot of what we have traded in the past and much of our current economy depends on the disposition of this continent's first inhabitants. A just transition that does not account for and reverse this fact is not one worth pursuing. Which, which brings us to the question of how current trade and investment treaties pose serious, but not insurmountable, obstacles to achieving that kind of transition and other visions embodied in the Green New Deal. We should begin with the World Trade Organization, or WTO, whose rules still provide the basic framework governing global uh, commerce. When the WTO was established in 1995, it incorporated and greatly expanded on the previous General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or GATT. Many non-trade or only marginally trade-related areas were constrained by the WTO, including intellectual property rights, services, and the setting of health and safety standards. Importantly, the WTO also created a binding dispute settlement mechanism, which has been used mainly by powerful countries to enforce favorable rulings through, through punitive tra trade sanctions. These changes in the mid 1990s were agreed to by rich countries and global corporations negotiating in secret and then presented to smaller countries as a fait accompli. Later, as the impact of the new rules became more widely understood by developing countries and civil society, they generated controversy and protests leading up to the Seattle ministerial meetings in 1999. Today, these provisions are just as problematic from the perspective of, of addressing the climate emergency through a global Green New Deal or deals. Intellectual property rules establish inflexible 20 year monopolies on patented products and processes. When what is needed is the rapid transfer of renewable energy and other climate friendly technologies around the globe. Trade and services obligations discourage the creation of public services and state enterprises. When what is needed is a massive boost in public services, public investment and public ownership. WTO services rules are designed to keep committed sectors permanently open to foreign service competition. They disallow single service providers, even if that single provider is the public sector. WTO rules on standards discourage distinguishing between products based on how they were made, which makes it harder for public policies to favor low carbon products and industries over polluting carbon intensive ones. In fact, the WTO is better understood as a comprehensive system for protecting private property rights from state or democratic interference rather than simply a, as a tool for keeping trade flowing. The WTO's role in frustrating locally based renewable energy initiatives illustrates this basic conflict. There has been a flurry of WTO challenges against government support for renewable energy. Since 2010, there have been eight complaints against subsidies, local content requirements, and other state supports for re renewable energy. 
These disputes are occurring despite warnings from climate scientists that we have less than a decade to drastically cut global emissions to meet the agreed target of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Three cases have already been decided by the WTO dispute summit body. In each, local benefit measures were found to violate WTO rules. In 2009, the Canadian province of Ontario introduced the Green Energy Act that can fairly be, fairly be described as Canada's first Green New Deal policy. It offered generous incentives for renewable energy, but to access those benefits, a high percentage of the solar and wind technology had to be made in Ontario. Four years after this policy came into force, it was struck down by a World Trade Organization dispute settlement panel after challenges from the European Union and Japan. The WTO ruled that the local content requirements attached to Ontario's incentives for renewables were illegal, dealing an unfortunate blow to the landmark climate and green jobs strategy. The province responded by removing domestic content requirements and later killed the legislation, which was coming under heavy attack from opposition parties and right-wing think tanks. In 2013, the US went to the WTO to challenge an Indian national government program that offered long-term contracts for solar power at guaranteed rates on the condition that the solar power developers use a certain percentage of panels and equipment manufactured in India. After the US won its case in 2016, the Indian government promptly launched its own challenge to similar provisions employed by US states. Similarly, after China's solar incentives were attacked by the US government at the WTO, the Chinese government filed a complaint against solar production incentives in Washington State, Connecticut, Montana, California, Michigan, and Delaware, which were all designed to encourage local job creation. In late 2019, the WTO ruled in favor of China, but an appeal has yet to be heard. This destructive cycle of lawsuits, countersuits, and retaliation over incentives to scale up the local production of renewable energy is hard to believe, especially during a climate emergency. Meanwhile, there's never been a single WTO dispute over subsidies to the fossil fuel industries, which are far, far larger. Clearly, these are major failings in our international trade and investment system. They suggest our countries or governments are more concerned with mindless adherence to free trade dogma than to real solutions to climate change and sustainable trade. In the face of a climate emergency, WTO litigation and the chilling effect it exerts on climate action must end. A little later in this webinar, we will discuss some strategies for addressing these problems, but for now, I'll turn it back to Hadrian and Pia. Thank you. Thanks very much, Scott. Uh, Pia, I'll turn it to you now to uh, ask the same thing. Can you maybe tell us a bit about how trade agreements and investment treaties have been used to challenge what otherwise seemed like promising national renewable energy policies? Yes, thank you, Hadrian. And thank you also for the organizers, to the organizers for inviting me and hello to all the participants. It's great to see such a large number. Um, what I will talk about is specifically um, the regime of investor state dispute settlement and the Energy Charter Treaty and how they have been used, particularly against government action to keep fossil fuels in the ground. Um, Adrian, you already mentioned, or explained a little bit about ISDS. I guess many people on this webinar know the regime. It basically allows companies to sue states outside of their courts in private tribunals where you have three private lawyers who then decide whether the far-reaching rights of foreign investors in investment treaties have been violated. And if they come to that conclusion, they can ask the state to pay a lot of money in compensation to the investor, money that very often wouldn't be available under national courts or European courts, at least not in that amount. Um, and companies have indeed used this regime to challenge um, climate action by governments and in particular decisions uh, to phase out coal, uh, to uh, limit drilling of new oil and, and gas. Um, and I wanted to give two examples from Europe 
um, these are cases that have been filed under the Energy Charter Treaty. The Energy Charter Treaty is one of many thousands of agreements uh, around the world that allow, give investors these rights. It is interesting because it binds many countries, more, more than 50 from Western and Eastern Europe and Central Asia mostly. Um, and the, ex the first example I want to give is a case against Italy that is ongoing uh, since 2017. Italy has been sued by a UK company, Rockhopper, an oil company. Um, why is that so? That the reason is that the Italian parliament banned any new oil and gas drilling in a certain distance from the Italian coast. Uh, the rationale at the time was not so much a climate rationale, it was more um, a reaction to a decade of protests from the region, um, mainly raising environmental concerns about the drilling and also economic um, concerns around the local fishery and tourism industry. Uh, but the effect was that there was no more new oil and gas drilling and Rokopa is now challenging that decision. It is claiming up to 350 US dollars in compensation. That interestingly is seven times more than the money that the company actually spent for exploration, studies, etc. Um, as I said, the case is ongoing, um, but if Italy loses, um, it could have um, a chilling effect for other countries who decide to keep fossil fuels in the in the ground. A second is example is a second example is also from the Energy Charter Treaty. It is very recent. It is a claim that is not yet there, uh, but that is actively threatened by a German company, Unipa. Um, which interestingly enough is owned by a state-owned company from Finland. And Unipa and its owner Fortem are threatening to sue the Netherlands before, because last year the Dutch parliament decided to say no more burning of coal for electricity by 2030. So that's the Dutch coal phase out. Um, we know that in December Unipa took the first step to actually to the Netherlands. Um, they are now uh, discussing the two parties, the Netherlands and the company, to try to find a solution. But if that is not found, then the claim will could, could come and it could be um, up to a billion euros uh, claim. There are other examples from around the world. I'll just briefly mention two that many of the people on this webinar will know. One is a case that a Canadian company launched against the US over the very controversial Keystone XL pipeline, which was stopped by the former US President Obama. And that stop was challenged um, in an arbitration court under NAFTA. The company withdrew the claim once a President Trump um, allowed the pipeline, but at the time experts agreed that the company would have had a good chance of winning the case. It was super expensive, a staggering US uh, 15 billion US dollars, I think that's what they were asking. Um, and similarly, Canada um, has been challenged or is being challenged since last year by a US company, a coal company, who is not happy um, with the decision by the province of Alberta, who basically decided the same thing than the Netherlands uh, to stop the burning of coal for electricity by 2030. So these are four cases that are very clear, I would say, climate cases and show how the regime can be used by polluters to basically <laughs> get ask compensation when, when governments do the right thing, namely make decisions to keep fossil fuels in the ground. And expert, experts have won for several years that this is just the tip of the iceberg, that there might be more cases we don't even know of and more will be coming. Um, and just when I end, just to underline why are these cases such a big problem? Um, I think there's two reasons. One is um, the fact that they be, can become very expensive, more expensive than any challenge that could hit um, a government in, in national courts um, or under European law, for example. There are many reasons for that. One reason is that it is very common um, for companies in this regime to demand compensation, not just for the money that they actually spent on a project, actually invested, but the money that they could have made had a pipeline been approved, had a new oil drilling rig been approved and, and, and drilled oil for 10, 20, 30 years. So you can imagine 
uh, how big the money, um, how big the sums can be if a tribunal says, yes, you, you are right, you shouldn't have st been stopped and you should be compensated for these expected future profits as well. And because the regime can be so expensive, and this is the second reason why it's so dangerous for climate action, there is a very high incentive for governments to actually not uh, go down the path of ambitious, ambitious climate action when they are sued or when there is a threat of such an expensive lawsuit. Um, governments also have to keep an eye on taxpayer interests and because ISDS can be so uh, expensive and is so unpredictable, they are well advised to take these threats seriously, which is why the risk um, that this regime creates a regulatory chill on climate action around the world uh, is particularly high. So I would basically conclude a bit like Scott. I think in, yeah, in times of a climate crisis, uh, there should be absolutely no space for the threat of such lawsuits and for actual lawsuits. So this is why, is one of many reasons why ISDS has to go. Great, thank you very much, Pia. Um, I will note that we're now over 100 participants, so it's really great to see so much uh, enthusiasm for the topic. Just a few housekeeping notes if you joined us late. Uh, first of all, there is uh, interpretation, live interpretation into Spanish available. Just click on the globe uh, at the bottom of your Zoom window and you can choose which language to listen in. So if you'd like to listen uh, in Spanish, you can, otherwise leave it as English or off. Um, please do join the chat. So if you click on the, on the chat button, you can speak to, uh, you can speak to us as panelists or to uh, everyone who's viewing the webinar. Just make sure you choose um, who you want to send it to. So by default, your, your messages only go to, to the panelists. Um, and you can click that drop down menu and select all panelists and attendees, and then everyone will see your message. So feel free to select that and then uh, introduce yourself to those, uh, everyone else who's watching. And we'd also really like to encourage you to submit some questions. So there is a next to the chat uh, button on your Zoom window, there is a Q&A button. If you click on there, you can submit some questions for us uh, and we'll do our best to answer all your questions uh, in just a few minutes once we've gotten through uh, a, a few more rounds of discussion. Um, on that note, uh, this was a, we kind of had a pretty uh, dour first round there with uh, Pia and Scott explaining a lot of the problems uh, that FDAs present for the idea of a Green New Deal. So maybe let's talk about uh, how we start working around some of these constraints, because of course we can't just wait for trade reform before we start acting on a Green New Deal. So uh, my question to the two of you is, uh, are there, first of all, are there short-term strategies that we can take uh, and governments can take to work around uh, the trade and investment treaty obstacles that you've both described? Um, and then thinking longer term, how can we uh, change or what, what do we do with the multilateral system so that it can better support the transition to a just uh, and decarbonized global economy? Pia, why don't we start with you? Um, sure. I mean, actually, governments are already working around, so I'll continue talking about ISDS, the issue I spoke about before. So governments are already trying, you know, to uh, design climate policies in a way that they cannot be sued. I spoke about this example of the Dutch coal phase out, which is challenged by a German coal company. Um, and the Netherlands was very well, very aware of the risk of ISDS suits. Uh, we know that from internal documents. And what they did is they say, well, let's just go for a very long period <laughs> that the coal companies can continue polluting and only ban the burning of coal for electricity by 2030. It's quite a long period, you know, of, of ongoing emissions uh, in times of a climate crisis. And the government said, well, maybe that limits the risk of being sued. So governments are trying to find ways around, um, around to mitigate the risk, but obviously that's not the strategies um, we want. There are other actions that could be taken um, that are discussed and are increasingly discussed at the moment because there is also a high risk of ISDS suits against governments that act to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is why these reform proposals or, or changes do um, get a bit of attention at the moment. For the area of climate change, one solution or one part of a solution could be that in any future international climate agreement, you include a little paragraph saying 
everything we do to protect the climate cannot be challenged under any ISDS treaty around the world. There have been proposals uh, made before the Paris Agreement was signed to include such a paragraph. Uh, that was not included back then, but who knows, maybe it's an opportunity uh, for the next climate negotiation. So that would be one way. Another way would be to um, say, okay, we have these thousands of treaties, they present a problem. We, um, we write up a new international agreement, a, a multilateral instrument where we basically say the same. So outside of an international climate treaty, basically saying, no challenges against climate action uh, under uh, trade and investment uh, treaties. Uh, so these are measures that could be taken. Obviously, it's a question of political will <laughs> and, a, and a question of, of public pressure. Maybe a last one, and that is an option that governments have already taken, is, is basically to get out of the treaties, to terminate them bilaterally as one country, to terminate them with the agreement of the trading partner, or again, to sign another agreement where you basically wipe out um, these treaties in, in one go or a large number of it. It sounds um, radical, but it's actually not because it's steps that countries have taken around the world in the last year. Just very recently, 23 EU governments said, we want to terminate the treaties amongst us because they have been found to violate EU law. So they just wrote up a treaty and did it. So it is, um, it is where possible. Unfortunately, um, it's not yet, I would say, the main trend because um, we do see governments around the world negotiating new treaties that give more or less the same power to corporations. Um, so, um, and the Energy Charter Treaty, which I mentioned, is being expanded to the Global South. So unfortunately, we also do have um, another trend of getting us deeper into the mess and making it more uh, difficult for governments to, to act on the climate. So I would say it's still a lot of work to do for us. Yeah, um, yeah, I would I would highlight speaking of governments that have moved in that direction, they, they recently renegotiated NAFTA agreement, the Canada US, uh, whatever, CUSMA, USMCA, uh, did uh, in large part re restrict and, and in part eliminate ISDS. So uh, maybe for questionable motives in that case, but the fact is that uh, some important governments have established that precedent that we we can actually eliminate or, or reform uh, ISDS. It's not uh, it's not impossible to do that. Um, Scott, I'm going to turn it to you. Uh, this, the same question. Uh, we can't we can't wait necessarily for long term reform. Although I'd like to hear your thoughts on what the long term should look like. And are, are there short term strategies that governments can take to work around some of the constraints you've mentioned? Sure. Um, thank you. Thank you, Hadrian. Thank you, Pia. Uh, yeah, I mean it's it's crucial uh, that we protect climate action from trade and investment treaty challenges, and that we don't let the obstacles that we're discussing today in any way discourage us uh, or uh, get us to reduce pressure on, on our governments to take decisive action, which is clearly needed. Now, I would suggest that we could use a peace clause to stop the escalating trade wars where countries are challenging each other over public policies to promote green energy or other climate friendly initiatives. So the goal would be to negotiate a global moratorium on climate-related trade disputes. Uh, peace clauses have been used uh, before uh, in certain aspects at the WTO, certain aspects of intellectual prop trips, intellectual property rights implementation. Uh, they've been used uh, in, in the agriculture sector. Um, so it's not unprecedented, but again, it, it, it would be time-consuming uh, to negotiate uh, such a such a clause, but I would suggest that individual countries could act immediately and on their own by vowing not to initiate any environment related disputes and withdrawing support for investment challenges initiated by domestic firms against other countries there's a there's a silver lining here to the current impasse at the WTO where the appellate body has stopped meeting because of the US administration's refusal to approve the appointment of new judges. As uh, discussed earlier, late 
last year, a WTO panel ruled against a range of U.S. state government renewable energy incentives and job creation programs. That was the dispute brought by the Chinese government. But as long as the WTO appeal system is stalled, the dispute remains in limbo. Now, other member governments uh, facing similar challenges could, could also choose to appeal adverse rulings into the void, as they say in Geneva, which would buy precious time in the fight against climate change. In the longer term, to effectively address global warming, we will need new international trade rules and new approaches to intellectual property, services, government procurement, and product standards. Monopoly patent rights should be eliminated from trade agreements, leaving the regulation of intellectual property to national governments and international organizations that are better equipped to balance commercial and public interests. Until this goal can be achieved, progressive governments should take full advantage of the flexibilities that exist under the current rules. One of the most important of these flexibilities is compulsory licensing, which could speed up the transfer and development of promising renewable energy and other climate-friendly technologies around the world. Compulsory license is basically um, the suspension of patent rights, payment of royalty um, to the holder of those intellectual uh, property rights and making the technology, whether it's for medicine or for uh, renewable energy or some conservation uh, process, freely available uh, upon payment of royalty to, to everyone. Um, new rules must also let governments use public purchasing at all levels, local, provincial, federal, state, to encourage sustainable development and favor local employment in order to create green jobs and support the local economy. In each of the three renewable energy cases I discussed earlier, the WTO dispute settlement body rejected the defendants' sensible arguments that their programs were part of government procurement, which is actually exempted from the WTO's national treatment or non-discrimination rules. The overly strict interpretation of WTO rules needs to end when it comes to government efforts to address the climate emergency. What we need is a more holistic view where commercial rights are subordinate to human rights and the health of the planet. And as, been, as has been mentioned by all of us, public services must be fully protected by excluding them completely in all new and existing trade and investment agreements. Only by shielding public services from trade challenges will we ensure that all levels of government can create new public services expand existing ones and reverse privatizations without facing penalties under trade and investment treaties. And finally, as we've heard previously in this webinar series, and again from PIA today, we need an ironclad exclusion for climate related measures, which should be included in new and existing trade agreements. And as PIA said, in the next iteration, in the next iteration of a global climate pact, the primacy of climate action over trade and investment treaty rights should be clearly established. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, we're going to get into one more round of, uh, of our discussion before we open things up to your questions. Um, I do see lots of questions coming in into the chat window. It would be really helpful for us if you could also put your questions in the Q&A box. So uh, at the bottom of your screen uh, next to where it says chat, if you click on Q&A, you can actually put in uh, questions and that'll be helpful for us for organizing them, but uh, we'll also do our best to pull out uh, your your questions that you've written into the chat and we'll get to that shortly. We're going to do uh, one more round of discussion and we're going to back off for a second from some of the specifics of the free trade regime and talk a bit more about the uh, kind of political moment we find ourselves in. Um, and specifically, I'm referring to the, the COVID response that countries around the world are undertaking. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in talking about what lessons we can pull from that response uh, in the context of a Green New Deal and potentially for trade reform. So maybe I'll kick things off by uh, offering some of my observations about um, what, the, uh, what government's response to COVID means for uh, efforts to push a Green New Deal. And then I'll turn things over to P and Scott to respond and maybe tie in um, lessons for uh, trade reform. So 
in, in no particular order, uh, the first thing that, that I've noticed that I think is worth <laughs> really highlighting is that we need to listen to science, of course. Um, and that's amazingly what we've been doing in large part uh, in the response to COVID-19. Um, of course, it's still being politicized, there's still challenges, but uh, we all know our public health officials by name in a way we never did before. Uh, we see governments and politicians deferring to public health experts and epidemiologists uh, on this issue. And of course, we need to do the same thing in the context of climate change. Our, 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 the science should be front and center, um, and the scientists need to have a more prominent place at the table. Um, another observation is that governments are acting based on the worst possible outcome to COVID-19, and that's the correct thing to do. Um, they're not saying, well, it's, it's possible that an uncontrolled outbreak doesn't harm us, so let's take the chance. They're saying there's a chance that an uncontrolled outbreak is catastrophic and therefore we must take serious actions. And of course, the same is true of climate change. We don't know exactly what's going to happen, but we know that the, the worst possible scenario for climate change is uh, existential for us, and we really can't take that risk. Another observation uh, is that governments are thinking long-term and acting short-term. What we've seen is the most successful countries to respond to COVID have been the ones that imposed very uh, this kind of severe and aggressive measures while case counts were still low, um, before they got so significant. So it seemed like an overreaction, but in, in hindsight was the right approach. Um, again, climate change is the same. If we wait until uh, it's, there's kind of incontrovertible evidence, although of course there already is, but, uh, but just uh, kind of devastation beyond our comprehension to then decide to take action on climate change. Of course, it's too late. Another qu a couple quick observations. One is that we've seen uh, some incredible behavioral change in the context of COVID-19. And of course, not all of that change is, is something we want to preserve. Uh, we don't like physical distancing is not a necessarily solution to climate change or anything. But the point is that what we thought of as kind of immutable behaviors uh, can actually be changed. People can stop driving, they can stop flying, they can stop consuming as much very quickly. Uh, and so we can't be afraid of including behavioral and cultural change as part of our solution uh, to climate change. Similarly, uh, we've seen some incredible efforts by governments to mobilize strategic industries. Um, governments should be leading and directing private sector's response to crisis. We've seen that uh, with governments pushing manufacturers to uh, start producing personal protective equipment. Of course, we'll need similar efforts in the context of a Green New Deal to get uh, our manufacturers, our private sector uh, moving in the right direction. We've seen unprecedented supports for displaced workers. Uh, of course, we need to do the same thing for fossil fuel workers and anyone displaced uh, either by climate policies or by climate change itself. So really the overarching lesson that I've pulled out of these last few months is that in the response of, of a very severe and significant crisis, you need to go big and you need to go fast. Um, and again, we've seen that the countries that have been most successful in suppressing COVID-19, but also the ones that have been most successful in rebounding, were the ones that took the most aggressive and comprehensive action uh, in the short term. So they incurred the greatest short term costs, but uh, the lowest long term costs. And, and that's a, a lesson that rings true uh, in the context of climate change. So I'm going to turn things over to uh, P and Scott. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this issue. How has uh, COVID-19 and, and the government response to COVID-19 maybe changed, the, uh, changed the, the environment for how we talk about a Green New Deal and about trade? Pia, why don't we start with you? Mm. Hmm. I don't know if it has already changed, uh, you know, uh, the attitude towards trade policy uh, amongst governments, but I think there is a potential it will. Um, I mentioned um, potential ISDS lawsuits against measures that governments are taking in the context of the pandemic, be they, you know, action to produce affordable vaccines or um, decisions that allow people, you know, to uh, still have access to clean water to wash their hands, even though they can no longer pay the, the, the water bill uh, and all the economic measures that we will see in the future um, around, you know, debt restructuring, etc., that governments will need to take to deal with the economic and financial crisis. All of these measures are mentioned by international law firms that make a lot of money when investors sue states and they are already advertising the ISDS regime to them. 
Um, this is scandalous, but it also uh, brings with it the opportunity, you know, to show how um, grotesquely <laughs> crazy this regime is and how dangerous it can be for governments, you know, that j just protect the health of their people and, and try to prevent economic collapse. So I think there is a potential to, to use the COVID crisis and the, the advertising we are seeing and the potential claims that will come um, to highlight the flaws of this specific angle um, of, of the trade regime. And I think linking it to climate change then is just it's an easy step. And I see that, I, I don't know how it is um, or how, how the debate was about the, the case that I mentioned that was filed against the US or the ongoing case against Canada. But in Europe, people care or start to care about ISDS when they hear that climate action is being challenged in this regime. Uh, climate activists are outraged, the media is getting interested. So um, there are opportunities and it's, it's up to us. Uh, to just try uh, to use them again and again. And I think, I mean, the, what, what you described, um, Hadrian, the yeah, unthinkable steps um, that governments have taken in the pandemic or unthinkable a couple of months ago. Um, the, I think when you look at them at face value, some of them are actually not so big or they appear big as decisions because we, our imagination has become so small, you know, in the there is no alternative uh, neoliberal heydays. Uh, and the same is true for the trade regime. I mean, canceling an agreement that is there for, let's say, 20 years, but has no or very few public benefits and many public risks shouldn't be such a big decision. And maybe that's what the pandemic and the reactions by governments to it teaches us, you know, that we can become a bit more brave again in our thinking um, and describe actions as actually not so big, but just common sense uh, and, and very important actions. So um, I do hope that the space for changing the trade re regime um, will, be a, will become a little bit bigger uh, in the context of this crisis than it has been in the last years. But obviously, as you all know, there's also the risk that it, the exact opposite happens and that we will get more of the same um, as, as, as a response that is pushed um, by big business also in the context of the crisis. So yeah, I don't know, it's, it's maybe a bit of an ambivalent answer. <laughs> Thanks, Pia. Uh, Scott, uh, same question to you. What lessons can we draw from the COVID-19 pandemic and, and the government response to it that are, are relevant to the struggle for a global Green New Deal? Um, okay. Uh, as we've heard previously in this series, many of the most effective steps to stimulate a just economic recovery from the pandemic and global Green New Deals, they lie outside the trade system or are act actively discouraged by current rules. Now, while the COVID-19 crisis is still far from contained in developed countries, its impacts in the global south are, are, are I find them really terrifying to watch. As Walden Bellow said in, in the very first webinar of this series, the economic impacts in regions like Latin America could end up endangering as many people as the virus itself. Uh, developing countries face a cascade of problems, worsening debt loads, loss of remittances, economic hardship from low commodity prices, drying up of demand in foreign markets, and shortages of uh, affordable food and medicines. Now, in, in confronting the pandemic and in advocating for global Green New Deals, the left should pursue a vision of genuine international cooperation in contrast to both the neoliberal mantra of restoring open markets on the one hand and right-wing xenophobic isolationism on the other. Many of the most promising progressive solutions to the COVID-19 crisis and, and the recovery that must follow that should also be part of a coordinated global response to the climate emergency. These include full debt forgiveness for the global south, technology transfer and suspension of intellectual property monopolies for vaccines, medicines, and green energy technologies, 
massive increases in foreign aid to assist with containing the pandemic, and a green economic recovery. More, like, more localization of production, beginning with essential products such as food and medical supplies, and increased resilience of local and international supply chains. And finally, fair taxation and clamping down on corporate tax avoidance to finance basic public services and economic recovery. We need to be seriously considering global wealth taxes and, and financial transaction taxes. Now, in crafting a global Green New Deal, developed countries and privileged elites that are most responsible for the climate crisis must shoulder the greater responsibility. How the world addresses the pandemic and its impacts in the global south will be an important test as to whether we are able to build a fair, just transition to a decarbonized economy and whether displaced workers and frontline communities in the north and south will trust global green new deals aimed at supporting them on, on, this, trans on this transition. So at that point, I'll turn it back to you, Hadrian, and uh, open, we can open the floor to questions. Thanks very much, Scott. Yeah, that's, that's exactly uh, what we'll do. So we've got a whole bunch have uh, now come in. So thank you very much. Again, if it's not too late to add your questions, click on the Q&A box. Uh, you can type in a question there and we'll do our best to, to get to them. Uh, I also want to just mention uh, to welcome our viewers who are joining us on Facebook. So this, this Zoom call is being streamed live to Facebook and we've got a number of people there as well. So you're not going to be able to type into the, the Q&A box, but hopefully uh, you're still getting a, a lot out of this. So let's go to our first question. Um, I'm gonna combine a couple that, that we've seen overlapping. And this first one is about uh, basically the issue of campaigning. So what are the kind of, what are the, the key points that, that you see uh, campaigners having uh, the biggest impact right now in reforming the trade, uh, trade regime? And, and on a related note, we had a question about where, where are the environmental NGOs? Because it seems like a lot of campaigners who used to, to work on trade have made climate their focus and, and have maybe left trade behind. Um, so what's the role for, for environmental NGOs and what is kind of the broader uh, role for campaigners uh, in reforming this, uh, this system? Um, uh, we can go to, either of you can pass on this, but maybe we'll start with uh, Scott to respond to that question. Okay. Um... And um, I, I'm very keen to hear Pia's uh, views on this as well, but I, I think the most campaignable um, uh, action items right now are eliminating ISDS. Uh, as Hadrian says, we've seen that as possible, at least as between Canada and the United States in COSMA. Um, it's fantastic work that's being done all around the world and uh, by the CEO and others, uh, Seattle to Brussels network in, in, in Europe. Um, I think this is a real moment to double down on that campaign. Um, a second, I think, focus that encompasses a lot of what we've been talking about is just basically this um, simple idea of shielding climate action from challenge under trade and investment treaties. And there are various ways that could be accomplished, but uh, uh, you know, through a, in the next Paris Treaty or in agreements if we are negotiating the further or just unilateral declarations by governments that they're not gonna abide challenges to their, their climate initiatives. Um, as for environmental um, NGOs, um, I mean, I, I see quite a bit of interest from environmental NGOs in these issues. I mean, especially uh, ISDS. And uh, although it's true that I would say uh, in North America, some of the coalitions uh, were quiet uh, for a period of years. I mean, we've been at this for a long time. I think, uh, you know, there's certainly uh, climate action um, activists and uh, many, many environmental groups work closely with CCPA and others now. And so I, I feel like we are, uh, we're, we're in this together. 
Uh, I can turn over to Pia in just a second, um, but we had a, a question about uh, what is ISDS? So it's a, a, an acronym we've been throwing around a lot. Uh, it stands for Investor State Dispute Settlement. Uh, it's a clause found in, in many free trade and investment agreements that allows uh, a foreign investor or a foreign or multinational corporation to uh, sue uh, a host government for measures that, that may have affected the, their investment, uh, affected its profitability uh, or otherwise. Um, and so that, that, that's come up a lot. And I should mention that uh, we have a webinar coming up next week. We'll talk a bit more about it at the end of, th of this one um, that will be looking into uh, ISDS in a lot of detail. So uh, certainly if you're interested in the topic, do please tune in next week. But we'll turn things over to Pia to uh, address the issue of, of campaigning. Well, I actually, I would second what, what Scott has said. I think ISDS is vulnerable and we just need to continue to try to bring it down. It, it will fall <laughs> at, one, at one point. And, and the pandemic and climate change are to, I mean, I don't want to sound cynical, no, but from a campaigning perspective, they are very good issues, you know, to educate the public and policymakers about the risks of this regime. Um, I think there's also educational work to be done around the, again, maybe the pen, to also look at the pandemic and measures that governments are taking in the areas of, of, of medicines and economic recovery and how they clash with other provisions in trade agreements. Um, I don't think that has, that ha this has been done enough yet. Um, and on the question of environmental NGOs, I, I think it's our job, you know, to bring them back into the trade arena um, if they have left. Uh, these are complicated issues, um, but it's our job then, you know, to tell climate activists and climate organizations what is the problem with this regime. Um, and I, I agree with Scott, I see the same in Europe. They're, they're, it's maybe not the number one issue on their agenda, but climate change is also a very vast agenda. Um, but they, they, they are, they understand uh, the risk, and they are willing, you know, to jo to join our work. So I wouldn't be so pessimistic, mystic on the environmental groups. Pia, we have a question about uh, moving kind of from campaigning to. The kind of more bureaucracy or or the kind of closed door negotiations. Uh, what do we need to do to change how trade negotiations happen so that we can achieve some of the goals we're talking about? And I might add add to that question, um, Pia, since you did mention that there are a number of countries uh, that have started to move in a positive direction, certainly not all of them, but some countries have started to either roll back ISDS or pull out of treaties entirely. Can you can maybe speak to what changed within those countries? Uh, was it the was it their uh, their negotiators that changed? Was it their political leaders that changed? What happened uh, kind of in the seat of power that that caused those governments to take a new direction um, when it came to trade negotiations? So, Pio, why don't we start with you, and then we can go to Scott. Um, well, so I wouldn't say that their position changed to trade negotiations as a whole, but for some of the countries that got out of ISDS, terminated some treaties, renegotiated others, um, the first thing that happened, unfortunately, is they were hit by claims, sometimes very scandalous ones, very expensive ones. So um, that initiated a process of realization of uh, damn, what did we sign in the 90s that now, allow, now allows a, an investor to challenge um, anti-discrimination policies? We never expected that. Um, so unfortunately, in the world of ISDS, unless it becomes very painful for a government, there you will see very little change. But once that happens, once the claim hits, that opens, um, opens the space uh, for civil society then to build pressure. And I think that is what happened in countries like Ecuador, like Bolivia, India as well, Indonesia. Um, so it is a combination of the claim, uh, campaigning, public pressure, and then probably the right, the right uh, government uh, in power. Um, so yeah, maybe that's, 
that's the answer. And on the question of trade negotiations and do they have to change? Of course, that is a big part of the problem. Negotiations are happen, be, happening behind closed doors. The public sees the trade agreement when it's a done deal. Uh, there is very little opportunity before to understand what's going on to um, you know, to have an informed public debate, like what, what is just normal with every other law <laughs> in a democracy. It's a problem that you have such a strong grab of corporate lobbyists on negotiators. The mindset of negotiators is a problem. You know, we just open up the world uh, and automatically uh, <laughs> that will produce benefits for the wider public with other officials with which would represent other societal interests not being present. So yes, the way these negotiations are conducted continues to be a problem. And so again, it's our job to continue to, to, to highlight these flaws. They, they can be used actually to create uh, scandals. I mean, I don't know again about other parts of the world, but in Europe, journalists love it. You know, when you just show them, this is the list of, I don't know, uh, businesses that are on advisory bodies that then advise the European Commission in their trade agreements. These are the long list of lobbyists they met. Um, for us, it might seem normal in the way the set a reality, but um, it is not for members of the public and, and the media as well. Adrian, you seem to be muted. There you go. You, you would like me to speak, Adrian? Yeah. Yes, please. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are so many ways to uh, answer that question. I mean, of course, uh, there has to be much more public participation and transparency before and during negotiations. How we achieve that is, again, just through um, public pressure. Um, I, I think, though, that, I mean, even among, uh, you know, free trade advocates, uh, neoliberals, there, there is a sense that this agenda is uh, running out of steam. Um, first, there's diminishing returns uh, when, when uh, trade barriers are, are already so low. And, and we have experience of you know, the many ways in which uh, trade agreements uh, enhance corporate power in ways that really have so little to do with trade. Intellectual property is one of the most ghastly investor state dispute settlement we, we've, we've talked about today. Um, we should acknowledge that the WTO is in serious trouble, although you know, there are those who think that, uh, um, you know, the answer is to double down and uh, uh, negotiate a very ambitious e-commerce agreement, uh, which again, is like just repeating all the mistakes uh, of the past, like uh, a corporate influenced agreement in an area where uh, national governments haven't even sorted out how they want to regulate it themselves. So, you know, there are those who haven't learned from the malaise that, that now infects the, the WTO, both on the negotiating side and, and the dispute settlement side. Um, I, I, guess, I guess the challenge for us on the left is, as I said earlier, is how do we counterpose Often, you know, the, the free traders and the neoliberals, they, they are in response to the Trumpian uh, challenge. They kind of wrap themselves in, in the flag of international cooperation. And I think we have to counterpose uh, and, and, the, and the, the climate emergency is, is a real opportunity to do that. We have to say, well, what would genuine international cooperation to the benefit of all really look like, because we don't see that reflected in, in, in these neoliberal trade agreements, trade and investment agreements. Thanks, Scott. Um, we've got a couple questions about the issue of regulatory cooperation. Um, it's a shame our colleague Stuart True is not on the panel because he's the real expert here, but maybe we'll dive into it briefly. 
Um, and uh, there, was a, there was a mention that, yes, although the USMCA, QSMA, whatever, uh, did roll back ISCS, it introduced this new idea of good regulatory practice so that instead of uh, corporations and investors being able to challenge regulations after they get in, put in place, they can now just prevent those regulations uh, from coming into place in the, initially. Um, maybe, uh, Scott, why don't we start with you? Uh, what is the, maybe you can provide a quick overview of, of what the risk is here, and is it, is it as significant as ISTS, um, or is it just something we have to keep our eye on? Well, uh, I think the risk is quite high. It's, it's, it's more insidious uh, uh, than ISDS, and it's so-called regulatory cooperation is probably the most significant um, new threat posed by the way that the trade invest the trade treaty agenda has been changing and and some of this is actually occurring uh, outside the context of, of uh, formal trade treaties but um, as you referred to Hadrian I mean the idea from corporate lobbyists is they they, they can't wait they don't want to have to wait to challenge a measure that a, a regulatory measure that affects them adversely after the fact uh, at the WTO or through a bilateral trade treaty or through investor state. They want to nip it in the bud. They want to be in the room when uh, regulations are formulated. And of course they are already, but um, regulatory cooperation is about formalizing that. It's about requiring um, national and, and uh, state and uh, provincial regulators to open themselves to influence and to consider the views or to delay until they have informed foreign stakeholders, usually corporations, uh, of what's going on. And it's just another, uh, I mean, anyone who thinks that our regulatory system is flawed because corporations don't have enough influence really hasn't looked very carefully at our, uh, at our regulatory systems. So uh, yes, it, it's a threat. I wouldn't put it on the same scale as ISDS, but it's, it's a way in which the, the agenda is slipping and sliding and shifting and that we uh, should be very uh, aware of. And I would commend um, the work of the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy and uh, Sharon Treat, uh, my colleague, uh, our colleague Stuart True, uh, and, uh, and again, CEO and, and uh, others who have been uh, dogging this file. So keep, keep it on your radar. Scott, uh, Pia, do you have anything to add about a regulatory, so-called regulatory cooperation? Uh, not much, maybe just um, two, um, two sentences in which the business uh, community describes it, which makes it quite clear, I think, what Scott just described. I mean, um, when the TTIP negotiations or the trade negotiations between the EU and the US started, or before they started, the US Chamber of Commerce and Business Europe, which is the biggest corporate lobby group in Brussels, they worked on a super long document about um, regulatory cooperation. And they, they thought, uh, they were pretty honest and say, what we want to do is we want to co-write legislation or regulation. So we want to, it's, it's really about co-writing. And the US Chamber of Commerce later said in a meeting with the commission, what we are, what regulatory cooperation is for us, is it's a gift that keeps on giving. You know, you can always use it. You can use it against, uh, you know, regulations to take toxic chemicals off the market. You can uh, take it against anything, you know, that makes maybe medicines more affordable, what have you. It's a gift that you can keep unpacking <laughs> um, as a company and as a business lobbyist. So that shows quite nicely why they are so keen to get it in trade deals. I would agree with Scott. It's a, it's a new trend. It's You can see it in trade deals across the world. And, and, and it is indeed dangerous, but very difficult for us, I would say, uh, to monitor and did not easy to campaign on, even if, if it's so clear, but the shadiness of how it works um, 
makes campaigning uh, quite hard, I would say, but still we have to do it. It's one of the new battlegrounds, I would say, in, in the trade field. Yeah, uh, I just want to highlight a comment we got from our colleague uh, Manuel Perez Rocha is just pointing out that that the the, the so-called elimination of uh, ISDS in the USMCA is uh, maybe not what it appears. Uh, and of course, uh, Canada and Mexico continue to have ISDS through TPP and so on. So it wasn't it wasn't a total victory, certainly, and we don't want to give the, the wrong impression. Um, and I would encourage you uh, again if you want to learn more about the topic. Manuel will be is one of the people involved in our webinar next week at this time. And they'll be talking more detail about uh, ISDS, uh, hard law and soft law. Um, we do have another question about uh, something that uh, Pia and Scott, you both mentioned uh, earlier on about we need some kind of uh, overarching clause or carve out or something um, to prevent uh, kind of trade, uh, uh, free trade agreements being used to challenge climate measures or prevent them from coming into place. Uh, and we have a question about what's kind of the most efficient, and maybe I'll add the word, what's the most. Um, uh, possible or, or, maybe, or, or maybe plausible approach? Is it to try and work through all of the existing network of agreements um, and trying to change each of them maybe at a bilateral level? Or is it is it possible that we can bring into force something like a new Paris Agreement that actually takes legal precedence over the existing uh, network of um, free trade agreements around the world? What, what's the more, I guess, realistic approach? Um, Scott, why don't you start? Well, there's a principle of international law that uh, later treaties among the same parties take precedence over earlier treaties. So clearly, the most efficient thing to do would be to have a, a multilateral instrument that just overrides um, previous rights. Now, that and and uh, so that that is that is the neatest solution. Um, it may take some time to get that. So that's why I emphasize that that countries and progressive governments should act on their own by saying they're no longer going to bring these types of cases. They're no longer going to support their investors or enable them to bring uh, cases again to challenge climate action. That the minimal harm that might be done to our companies, the imagined harms often, uh, are they're not, they're, they're, they're inconsequential compared to, you know, the um, assisting countries like China and India and others to move from coal-fired power to renewables. Uh, you know, we, we have to see the forest uh, for the trees here. So I think we should have progressive governments should should state very clearly that they're not going to abide by challenges. They're not going to bring them. And they, of course, like minded governments should begin working together uh, and build a critical mass to the point where we, we could achieve that uh, overarching multilateral instrument or a, a very um, concise paragraph uh, to be inserted in all these agreements, which would shield climate action. Pia, do you have anything to add? Um, maybe just, I think the experience of ISDS shows all these battles, even if they're small, and even if it's one government getting out, they're meaningful because they have knock-on effect effects on the regime as a whole. So while I would agree with Scott, obviously the a multilateral instrument negotiated by climate negotiators with no trade <laughs> folks in the room, you know, bringing in their loopholes that then make the instrument completely useless again. That would be super cool. <laughs> um, but at the same time, all the little fights um, are important as well. And we have a huge battle over the Energy Charter Treaty, for example, in Europe at the moment. Um, and if you imagined just that treaty being cancelled, or even if it's just the European Union member states leaving, which is a scenario that is maybe not around the corner, but it's not, it's not impossible. Um, that would stop the expansion of this agreement to the global south, you know, to Africa, Latin America, Asia, and prevent, you know, that uh, countries like Bangladesh, you know, get, get bound even more, you know, that are just getting into coal. So I would say all the little and the big fights um, are, are meaningful, and it's hard to predict what 
what knock-on effects they will have, but they will have. So, yeah, I would say it's it's not just the big scenario for the multilateral new agreement, but the little defensive fights as well that matter. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, it's a good reminder that, yeah, of course, it would be great if we had just like one document that just overruled everything that's out there. But there's a lot of value in, in, in winning these, these smaller battles. Um, one really quick question I'll, I'll address. Uh, why does the Green New Deal not mention nuclear disarmament? Um, and, and the short answer is it does. It just kind of depends on who you ask. Um, the Green New Deal is not owned by anyone. So it kind of depends on whose vision of a Green New Deal uh, we're talking about, but certainly nuclear disarmament is included in, um, in, in a lot of different formulations of a Green New Deal. Uh, I wanted to go to um, the uh, question of, if, if not the free trade regime, since we, are, we obviously have so many concerns about it, um, but we don't, want, we don't want to revert into a sort of nationalist, isolationist situation where we're not, uh, we're not engaging with other countries. So I'd be curious to hear um, from each of you um, whether that's in the context of EU and North America or, or more globally, what is, the, what, what is the alternative we would like to see? Um, how do we continue to have a productive international engagement and cooperation and, and of course trade, um, but not with these kind of restrictive neoliberal free trade agreements. Um, Pia, do you have, do you want to start on that one? I mean, that's a huge question, obviously. And um, I mean, for me, what has always been very inspiring is the, is the, the movement of La Via Campesina. So um, peasants, uh, um, landless people who for many years have worked as an international movement with people from the global south and the global north together and have developed an alternative concept that in this case obviously is limited to or not limited but has a strong focus on agriculture and food production um, but the principles you know that they came up with as an international uh, list solidarity movement if you think them through for other economic sectors as well i think um that gives a good indication it is not an anti trade focus but it shifts the focus from uh trading everything around the world whether it makes sense or not to who owns the means of production, who controls, you know, which parts of production processes, clearly a relocalization or re-regionalization of, uh, of global value chains. So I think we can learn a lot from these movements and the concepts that they have developed for many years in an internationalist uh, vision, not a, you know, we, we just close the borders and that's it. Um, but obviously, yeah, it's, it's a huge question. And it is interesting that in the context of the pandemic, we see governments, including crazily world market oriented governments like the German one, <laughs> so my government, so to say, um, really reconsidering um, the, um, yeah, how to say, the, the religion <laughs> of, of free trade and global value chains uh, because they have experienced uh, that they can also be vulnerable to the effects that they have. So again, I think it's an, it's an opportunity that, that we can use in this policy field. Uh, thanks, Pia. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it to Scott. Uh, and I, I should also maybe mention before you, you get going, Scott, that that the, uh, many of the people involved in producing this webinar series were involved in producing a report called Beyond NAFTA 2.0 uh, toward a progressive trade agenda for people uh, and planet, which uh, does actually start to address this question. And it's certainly worth having a look at uh, if you're interested in it. And on that note, Scott, uh, I'll turn it to you. Yeah, thanks. And I would also encourage people to look at that report where we tried to deal with this very huge issue. Um, in um, in in the context within the context of North America, but I think there's probably some. Well, I'm sure there are some uh, lessons for, for everyone there. Um, P has already referred to how the COVID nineteen crisis has shaken some of these um, globalization mantras and and shibboleths. Uh, I mean, 
everyone, including elites now, uh, acknowledge uh, the vulnerabilities in global supply chains that are, um, you know, organized around, well, long distance transportation for one, but, you know, saving pennies by uh, exploiting labor more effectively uh, somewhere else. So, I mean, we hear concepts like relocalization, concepts like resiliency are, are in the mainstream now. And uh, so there is an opportunity um, to, make, to make those fair trade uh, kind of arguments. Um, when, again, I think we do have to keep hammering on the point that the international trade regime, trade and investment regime, is really about enhancing corporate power. And, uh, you know, I read a, a book recently by uh, Quinn Slobodian, which I would um, recommend everyone. The WTO was actually theorized. It was conceived as a way to constrain democracy uh, uh, in order to uh, protect property rights by some of uh, you know the the uh, early neoliberal uh, thinkers, and obviously uh, it was uh, driven very heavily by corporate interests in in the EU and and in the United States in particular. So when we look at the trade regime, I think it's important that we we're not talking about isolationism. We're not talking about ending international trade and, and the benefits that can come from fair exchange. But what we're talking about is getting that trade architecture uh, back to basics. There's no place for intellectual property rules, which are actually the opposite of liberal trade in, in a trade regime. There's no place for investor state dispute settlement. Uh, we need more balance within the rules. We need more flexibility and all these like um, all this extra baggage that uh, corporate lobbyists were able to attach to the trade regime uh, needs to be uh, either dispensed with or, or reformed. Now, I'll just end by saying that, and, and this I think is, will be one of the themes in, in, ne in next week's webinar is because of its, uh, binding enforcement, the WTO and NAFTA and later other agreements kind of were elevated above other aspects of, of international law, like human rights, which is also binding, but, hard, uh, but they're hard to enforce internationally. Uh, environmental protection, uh, you know, sharing of, uh, of uh, intellectual property. So, um, I think what we have to do is pause. Well, we have to re retract and retrench on, on the trade and investment treaty side and build up the international system of uh, human rights, environmental protection, uh, climate action around it and create a, a more balanced international system. Uh, and that, that is obviously, uh, you know, a, a project of uh, lifetimes and, uh, but, Climate action gives us, uh, I think, um, a sense of urgency that, that we really have to tackle this now. Thanks very much, Scott. And I think that's a, a great place to end as we've reached the end of our time. Um, so I just want to say thank you again to uh, Pia Eberhardt and Scott Sinclair uh, for joining, joining me today. Uh, a big thanks to the whole team that helped put on this webinar, including Aaron Eisenberg, who's been doing a lot behind the scenes for us right now, um, and, and everyone else who's been involved in putting on this webinar series. Um, of course, uh, again, a big thank you to our interpreters, Patri and Cristobal, who've done a fantastic job making this uh, webinar more accessible. Um, and uh, as my uh, kind of concluding note, uh, I want to mention that we have another webinar coming up next week. It's going to be at the exact same time, whatever this local time is for you. Uh, it's 11 a.m. Eastern for me. Um, We're going to have a webinar on extractivism, human rights, and ISDS, hard law versus soft law. It's going to be a very uh, fantastic webinar um, with a number of great speakers. So I'd very much encourage you to join, uh, join that one. So again, thanks again. My name is Hadrian Mertens Kirkwood with the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, uh, and it's been a real pleasure to, to be your host today. 
Uh, and again, thank you very much and have a great day.